you know, in storytelling, you obviously love and sex and all that stuff is a part of life, but this story didn't need it. And there, mm -hmm. Carson didn't see a reason for it. And I just love that. I think it's, I think Carson is a really respectful person in his work and while at the same time really pushing boundaries. And um, that's a really exciting filmmaker. Hey folks, Brian Smith here with Dream Path Podcast, where we get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. Today we talk to Olivia Taylor Dudley. Olivia is an actress, a writer, and a producer who has worked in all genres of television and film. She was on five seasons, all five seasons, of the sci-fi channel fantasy series The Magicians, playing Alice Quinn. She was on sitcoms like Arrested Development, Curb Your Enthusiasm, and The Mindy Project. She had roles in horror movies like The Chernobyl Diaries, The Vatican Tapes, and Paranormal Activity, The Ghost Dimension. Her most recent film, though, is fantastic. It's called Some of Our Stallions, and it's written and directed by Carson Mell. And that's really what we talk about during the chat, mostly. Uh, we also go into some pretty surprising topics like social anxiety and what it takes to break into the business, what it takes to break into Hollywood and how she did that at age 17 by quitting school and moving down to Los Angeles. It's really a compelling story. And Olivia is a fantastic human being, just really fun to talk to and open about her career and her ups and downs and her challenges. So I really enjoyed this chat, but uh, it is one of three interviews related to the film, Some of Our Stallions. Uh, the next interview, which launches in a couple of days, is with the producer and co-star of the film. His name is Al D. And uh, next week, we are going to launch our final interview of this series with the writer and director and co-star, Carson Mell. So this is a really fun way to approach a great film. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. You can rent, rent uh, some of our stallions wherever you rent videos on demand. So let's jump into my chat with Olivia Taylor Dudley. Olivia Taylor Dudley, welcome to Dream Path Podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, I'm super excited to talk to you because it's not often that I see a screener film where I have zero expectations going in and you, you come away completely surprised by everything about the movie. I mean, there's just, this is a really special film. So maybe you could start off, Olivia, by just telling us how you got involved with this project, how you met Carson and Al. Yeah. I mean, I also think it's a very special project and I came to this project because I was friends with Al D. Uh, for the past few years, we met through a mutual friend um, at a table read and we just hit it off and we're like, let's make something together. And he's a super fascinating guy and very charming and very, I don't know, electric. And I was like, I want to work with him in any capacity. And we started thinking about a couple of different projects that didn't really quite go forward. And then I was in Vancouver uh, two years ago working on a season of a TV show I worked on. And I got a call that was like, hey, we've got this script with this guy, Carson, and, and I want you to read it. So I was like, okay. And I read it and I fell in love with the script immediately. And I was like, I need, I need to meet Carson. So Al kind of set Carson and I up and we had a Zoom meeting just like this. And we had a great time. And, and from that moment on, we were like, all right, let's make this. And I just, I read the script and knew that it was something very unique. And the idea of Al being a character in it was very exciting to me because, well, I've never seen him act. I don't think many people have. So it was, uh, and Carson's unique tone and what he has done, like I'm such a fan of his. So I thought all those pieces together could make something really special. And I think that's exactly what happened. So yeah, now they're my buddies. <laughs> yeah. Well, it seemed like on the set, and sometimes I think the audience kind of projects maybe what's happening on the set behind the scenes. And they assume that everybody's friends or they assume that they hate each other because of what's happening on screen. But the vibe that I got from this film is that you all had to be, number one, very trusting with each other because there's a lot of vulnerability with all of the characters here. And um, I just knew 
for some reason I knew that you guys were friends and you know, yeah. when I was watching like, this film. It's <laughs> Al is very infectious. He's really hard person to not have a good time with when you're in the room with him and, and Carson and him are like two peas in a pod. Like I'm glad that it was captured on screen, their friendship, but they're like so close in real life and such good friends and such oddballs together and very different personalities. But when you get them together, they make some sort of crazy, have some sort of crazy friendship, uh, no pun intended. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah. All of us were very close and I love those guys so much. And I think that that's why this movie works so well is that the friendship and the trust between us all really translates. Um, and that doesn't always happen, you know, but it's, it started with the script. The script works so well what Carson wrote that he just, you know, he pulled in the right kind of people that I think made it come together. Yeah. I can't imagine anybody else in the movie, but it was really fun. It was like me. I mean, it really felt like making a movie with friends. It's, it's, it was such a joyful, it was one of my favorite movie experiences filming I've ever had is working with those two because they're just hilarious. And they're, they're more, I wish I could describe how they are in person, but it's even funnier than what's in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us what it was like to actually make the film in terms of how much you adhered to the script, how much improv there was, and that process, that collaboration process that resulted in the final product. Yeah. I mean, we shot the film in Vancouver um, and we were all just kind of up here in our hotels, excited to shoot this movie. And there was just a real like family collaboration spirit on set. And Carson, he made us all feel very comfortable and I love working with him and I love working with actors who are also the director. It's something I really enjoy. Um, it doesn't always work. Sometimes it's too stressful on the director to also be acting in the film. But when you have somebody like Carson, who's has a really distinct, unique voice as an actor and a director, it made for really joyful time on set. And, and I think we stuck to the script pretty much the whole time. There wasn't too much improv, at least not from Bonnie. I mean, my character, Bonnie is kind of the straight man in the story and she doesn't, she's not really the comic relief. So, you know, there wasn't too much strain from the script for me and I didn't really need to, I think it was all there on the page, but I know that Carson and Al did do a lot of playing around with the words, but you know, it's all because you can dance with the words when you're, when you're playing with the director who's in the scene with you. So, mm -hmm. um, a lot of magic can come out of that when you're, when you're acting with the director because they're in it with you. So, um, yeah, those two guys were cracking up the crew every day, all day long. Cause I mean, they're hilarious, but yeah. no, I think we stuck, mostly stuck to the script. Yeah. Yeah, it, I think that comedy and dark, um, you know, dark drama really blend well together sometimes, especially when the director and writer know knows how to do it properly. Because there's just this, um, there's this, there's a lot of laugh out loud, mo laugh out loud moments in the show or the the movie, but it does get really dark. And it's that contrast, that juxtaposition between, you know, laughing one moment and then, oh shit, you know, is, is somebody going to get murdered here? I mean, that's, yeah. that's kind of the, the journey that you go on in this film. And I don't want to give too much away because I'd love my listeners to watch this film with, you know, very few expectations like I had going in in terms of the storyline. But I, th I think Carson did an excellent job of blending those two genres of films and also um, dealing with mental illness in a way that didn't make fun of people with mental illness. And um, I don't know, I just felt very respectful and um, appropriate because I used to work in a psychiatric hospital, so I, I kind of have some experience with it. Um, and it just seemed spot on to me. Yeah. I mean, when I got the script and I, I read the log line, I was like, oh, you know, a little hesitant going into it. Cause I'm like, well, I just want to make sure that the, the mental health aspect is handled in a respectful way. And then as I was reading it, I was like, oh, wow, this is, this is written from a perspective of somebody who has experience mental illness somewhere in their life in people they know and myself have experienced that and people in my life. And I just felt, it felt very real to me too. And it felt 
Like, you know, it's not all life is funny and dark every day, all day. Like it kind of just goes between those two things. And I think he did such a beautiful job of not making it about one of the one or the other. And then it kind of seamlessly goes between the two of them. I mean, I, I remember laughing out loud while reading the script, which, you know, that doesn't happen all the time. Something can be funny, but when you're reading it, it's you laugh in your head. But I was laughing out loud. I was like, these people are so ridiculous, but they also remind me of actual people in my life that I know. And and none of it seems out of, you know, reality. It all seems very based in reality. And I think he did a really good job with the mental health aspect of it. And that was what was most important to me going into this project was making sure I handled Bonnie properly. And, you know, as somebody myself, who's gone on mental, I had a mental health journey and people in my life, I felt like I had a voice in that and that I could bring that to her. And it was just really important to me to keep her really grounded and know what she was about and not always get caught up in what, whatever nonsense they were in, you know, and not acting crazy. And, you know, that just was, Bonnie was just different. She's just, they all have their own different perspective. And I think that making sure everyone was staying within their own perspective of the characters, why it all feels very real and grounded and and respectful. And I think it's a really important story. And I, I really want people to go into it with open eyes. And, and I think it, it, the, you don't expect what's coming. You don't expect the movie, even watching the trailer. When you watch the movie, I feel like it's, it's surprisingly so much more heartwarming and real and close to home for most people that I know who've watched it. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It just feels very real. Yeah. There's just some, some surprising elements to the film because when you see a Chinese American character who has a strong accent in a film, you almost expect because of the way Hollywood has treated those characters historically, you expect him to be the butt of the joke, some type of, you know, racist, even if it's not outright racist, but still the the point of his character is to somehow fulfill a role, a comic role because of his accent or, you know, but that wasn't even commented on at all and it's um it's really refreshing to see um al you know a character like al's character andy um treated like just a normal human being he's a friend of a beautiful bill and and that's it that's all you need and um yeah you know i feel like that's one of my favorite things about the movie is is you know the way beautiful bill treats andy just as another human being right on the level with him and it's not has nothing to do with, I mean, it's, you know, Al's accent and, you know, where he's from or any of that, none of that's ever brought up and it's not, that's not who he is. And that has nothing to do with the character and that's nothing to do with how Bill treats him or, or Bonnie. And I think that that's the biggest takeaway in this movie is, is not judging people, any, any person for where they are, who they are. And I think this movie does such a beautiful job of, of that. It's not, it's not about the labels in this movie. Mm-hmm. I think it's about removing yeah. the labels from all directions. And yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's beautiful. And I'm, that's one of the things I'm most proud of, of being a part of this film. Yeah. I think the same thing could be said of your character that it would be easy to go in a direction of, you know, even though there are sexual undertones in the film and there's a, there's a romance that's happening um, that really isn't dealt with like Hollywood typically deals with that they you know your character is not sexualized in any way i mean a little bit because andy is pursuing bonnie but um but other than that it's just you just don't expect to see it handled that way and that's what was so refreshing just across the board with how carson and i'm going to talk to carson tomorrow about it but um yeah it's just it's a great film i I hope my listeners go out and see it yeah, actually, I, that was when I read the script, I, I remember putting it down and telling my boyfriend, I was like, it's a movie where I don't have a the lead character, or the lead female doesn't have a sex scene or isn't in lingerie at some point. And I was like, this is amazing. This is so great because it just feels, but the love and the romance is very much earned, I think, in the movie. And, and you don't need to rely on selling sex to, to have people relate to a relationship forming and that, you know, I think, I think that that's something I was really excited about. Not that you, you know, in storytelling, you obviously 
love and sex and all that stuff is a part of life, but this story didn't need it. And there, mm-hmm. Carson didn't see a reason for it. And I just love that. I think it's, I think Carson is a really respectful person in his work. And while at the same time, really pushing boundaries. And um, that's a really exciting filmmaker to yeah. me. So your background, your IMDb filmography and, and television roles um, seem to be very different from the indie film role that you had here. Um, did you, were you looking for a project like this when Al called you or how, how, you know, how were you looking at your career at that point when you got that call from Al? Yeah. I mean, my career is all over the place, mostly because, um, you know, actors and actresses don't really have that much control over the work they get. They you, yeah. you get what you can. And right. I had done a lot of comedy growing up in my um, the beginning of my career. I had a web series called Five Second Films for eight years, where we put out a film every day for six years, and that spurred into doing a lot of guest stars on a lot of sitcom work and stuff like that, and and comedic movies and. I love comedy. I really love doing comedy, but I've always, since that's kind of what I started out doing, I've always tried to push away from it and wanted to do more dramatic work. And, but it's really hard to, to, to go between the two, you know, when people only know your work as one thing. And so I'm always looking for dramatic indie roles. That's Mm -hmm. like always what I'm looking for, but they're few and far between where the scripts are good and ones where, you know, they're not, trying to hire a a huge A-list actor to be in it. So it's, you know, it's, I love being able to go between both of them, but stories like this, real human stories are always where I want, where my heart is and where I'd like to be working. But um, yeah, it's just taking projects as they come and seeing which one is right and what's a good fit. Um, I love doing TV and film. I love doing both getting to do, I had been on a show, a series, called the magicians for the last five years. And when Al called, I was excited at the idea of getting to play one character for a month and beginning, middle and end of the story. Cause I had mm-hmm. been playing a character for five years where I don't know where the end is, you know, and that's, it's just a different way of playing it. And with this, it was a really fun thing to just tell a story and then walk away from the character. Right. And um, I just really love Bonnie and I hope I get to play more characters like her. Um, I like playing unhinged characters, live wires that are um, maybe not walking a normal path in life. And Bonnie's definitely somebody who is that. And that's kind of what I saw in her. Yeah. I like doing it all pretty much. (laughs) Well, I I watched um, the episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm that you were on, Fatwa last night because oh. <laughs> uh, I, I love curb and I, I was like I gotta go back and watch this one or rewatch it and and you do have I mean that's a a nice uh, talent set to have where you can go into sitcoms and you know fill a, a comic role or like magicians a completely different type of vibe of television show and a series you know a long you just your character arc is seasons long as opposed to you know one episode. That's a nice range to have as an actor. Um, wh- where are you going next? Do you, you have? Uh, I, I saw you have a th- some things in production, but you know, wh- where do you see yourself in the next three years, if that's even possible in your business? Um, it feels like an impossible question to answer. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I mean, my series ended right before, right when the pandemic hit. So I've kind of spent the last year and a half you know, looking for my next project. And I would really love to do another series again. I, I I fell in love with the idea of being with a character that long. And I got really lucky on that show because my character, Alice, is somebody I absolutely adored playing and um, loved every single day of going to work. So I, I would love to be able to do that again. But this, this year, I've kind of been focusing on um, finding smaller movies and finding movies that I can produce and be a part of from the ground up. And that's kind of what I'm doing now. I've got a couple movies in production um, that hopefully we'll be shooting at the end of this year. And I'm actually in Vancouver right now filming a movie. Um, it's kind of a, it's a smaller movie, but it's an action thriller movie, which isn't something that I've done yet as an action movie. So hmm. I'm finishing that up right now, but I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to, 
I kind of am always looking for a show to be on. And when I'm not doing that, I'm trying to do as many movies as I can of any size, as long as I like the character. So yeah, I just want to be working. I'm I'm a bit of a workaholic and it's that's a hard thing to be when you're an actor, when you have no control, you know, you have some control, but not all of the control when you get to work. Right. So did they make you yeah. quarant- did they make you quarantine for 14 days up there? Are they still doing that? Oh yeah. 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 It wasn't so, so bad though, because I'd been quarantining pretty much this whole time in LA. I I had not really been going out. So yeah. it wasn't that different. Can yeah. you tell us, I mean, I, I noticed that um, your filmography starts in roughly 2007. And I think that puts you at about, what, 22 years old or so when you were doing your first, um, you know, acting roles or w- when did you get started and what age and, and how did you find your way into the industry? I knew I wanted to be an actress since I was a little kid. Um, but then I didn't really get into it till I was a, well, I, a teenager. I guess that's still a little kid, but I, um, I didn't finish high school. I dropped out of high school when I was 17 to pursue acting and moved to LA. So I moved to Los Angeles when I was 17 by myself and just started trying to meet people. I mean, it was a completely different time in the business. You know, we didn't have social media. We didn't have any of that kind of stuff. But what we did start to have was web series. So when I first started out, YouTube was a new thing and people doing, making their own content was just starting to happen. So I was trying to find people to do that with, and I did with five second films and kind of cultivated this this troop of actors and filmmakers for a few years. And from that, ended up getting an agent and a better agent. And then, you know, just moving along and, and trying to find work hustling for myself pretty much. I, I, I used, I PA'd for like five years. I was an assistant for directors. I was working on award shows. I was working, I was basically working any day that I could be on a set when I first started out was a good day. I felt like I was accomplishing something and I think it took, yeah, the beginning of my twenties. So I was here for a few years in LA before I started actually booking anything. And I'd say the first few roles I got were mostly horror movies. I did a lot of horror movies in the beginning and I love horror movies. I would definitely yeah. keep doing that. Um, I think they've become, they've come a long way and people are accepting them on such a larger scale now and people love horror movies. But, oh yeah. Um, yeah. It's a Renaissance yeah, period for horror films. Yeah, I think. totally. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, I just hustled. And I think about now when I see, see these young kids on, on TikTok and, on Instagram and doing, making their own movies and YouTube channels. And I'm like, man, there, if all of this was available to me when I was 17, when I was first starting out, I would be in such a, I would be, I don't even know. I'd be so successful. I mean, (laughs) I mean, I feel like I am somewhat successful, but man, these kids have so much at their fingertips now, you know, it used to be like stealing cameras from friends productions and like, you know, you have a giant camera in a, an avid room. Like, how are you going to make it? Like now everybody's on their phones and you can do it anywhere. So for at the time I was doing pretty good. I was hustling pretty good. And, um, wow. Yeah. What did you, what did your parents think of that move at age 17? They were supportive of it. I mean, I dropped out of school in seventh grade because I had a lot of social anxiety and I couldn't quite function at school anymore. So they homeschooled me for from seventh grade till middle of my sophomore year. And then I said, I wanted to try going to the high school. And I went for a few months and then I just said, this isn't for me. I mean, I'm, I have a lot of social anxiety and uh, school learning and school environment just wasn't quite right for me. And I knew what I wanted to do. I was a very hardworking I was a very hardworking kid. I had like four jobs and, you know, I was, I knew what I wanted to do. I had a plan. I, I wanted to be an actor. I was going to go do this. And I think they saw the determination in me and they, they chose to believe in me instead of getting my way. And, and they've been my biggest champions. And yeah, there wasn't a day where they didn't think it was a good idea. And, and mostly because I just worked my ass off yeah. the second I got to LA I had nothing. And I was like, all right, I'm going to do this. And I never strayed from that path. And because I had their support, which was nice. I mean, I don't think dropping out of school and moving to LA as a teenager is necessarily the best thing for everybody, but if you have your head on straight, yeah, you know, yeah, you have to survive. (laughs) Where were you? Where did you move from? 
Well, uh, I grew up in the San Luis Obispo area in California. It's the central coast of California. And my family, we have a ranch up there. And um, I grew up riding horses and showing horses. And I still do. I have a horse in LA and I train horses. So I grew up with a, I think that's where I get a lot of my work ethic is working on a ranch growing up my whole yeah, life. And, makes sense. Um, yeah. And then I, uh, when I moved to LA, I first moved in with my cousins for a little bit and then with a boyfriend and then found my own place and just bounced around, lived in my car for a hot second. But yeah, I don't know. (laughs) I always do what I wanted to do. And I was nothing ever got in the way. Like, I think if you want to be an actor and you got to make it like you have to every day wake up and be like, all right, today sucks, but I'm just going to keep going. That is commitment. Yeah. Yeah. The the living in your car thing. I mean, that's just the truth. That wasn't long. That was just a brief moment in time. But uh, that's yeah. legit, though. I mean, that gives you some serious street cred in terms of how committed <laughs> you were <laughs> to be down there and make it happen. And then yeah. um, you start booking these horror films. And I, I watched the last Paranormal Activity movie that you did with Jason Blum. Um, yeah. That w- that was actually really fun. I I'm kind of disappointed that that that's the last one. At least I heard that that's the last one. I feel like they're going to make more. I don't know. Yeah, I don't th- think that franchise will ever die. But um, yeah, that was a really interesting movie to make. I mean, we shot it over the course of like eight months and it's mostly improv. Like there's a beat sheet for what the scenes are going to be. And we shot many different versions. That's kind of how they make all those movies. And uh, it was really fun. It was a really fun experience. I had done a movie with Oren Pelly, who I did um, Chernobyl Diaries. And Oren is the one who started, who created Paranormal Activity. So and we shot Chernobyl Diaries in kind of a similar fashion. So I was already kind of ready to do that. Yeah. I'm curious about the social anxiety that you were experiencing in school and how you adapted dealing with social anxiety in a work environment, especially in Hollywood, where I would imagine the pressures uh, are even more heightened in a in that type of a work environment where you have, you're ambitious, you want to you know, make sure that you are heard and seen and that you get opportunities. Um, what did you do? And if this is too personal of a question, no worries, but what did you do to adapt and cope with that social anxiety so that you could function in Hollywood? Well, it's a complicated question because I don't think I ever really adapted. I think that what I found out when I first moved to LA and was on sets, that's where I felt at home. That's where I felt comfortable. And it's still true to this day. When I'm on a film set, a TV set, doesn't matter. There's something about the environment in that community that I understand and I know my place and I'm very comfortable and I have zero anxiety when I'm at work. And that's what I found out. And that's how I knew that it was the right job for me because I could be in a room with a hundred people working and staring at me, or even if I was just PA, it didn't matter. Nothing. I was never nervous on a set. So I was like, okay, well, this is definitely the place for me. But then if I found myself in an environment like a party or something like that, you know, some sort of networking event, my anxiety was through the roof. So, you know, I, I really never excelled at networking in that way. I excelled at networking and hustling on sets. And in smaller environments, but I feel like I would have been a lot more famous, a lot faster at a younger age had I been better at networking at at bigger events and meeting people and not being scared to walk up to them because that's just definitely something that I never got over. And I, I I just always have to remember that I really just feel comfortable when I'm when I'm on a set. And when I remember that, then I have to like work my way to getting onto a set. Once I'm on a set, I'm happy as could be. But everywhere else in the world, it's a little. It's very draining and I'm a total homebody and it takes a lot out of me to go and talk to people, but Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I got better at it, but not great. (laughs) At at the risk of sounding like I'm psychoanalyzing, which I'm not, but I'm just trying to figure things out because I I have family members with extreme social anxiety and friends. And, um, but it sounds like when you're an environment that makes sense from the standpoint Mm -hmm. that okay, this is my work. I have to do this work. These people have to do their job. This all makes sense. Uh, you're, you're comfortable there, but when you're in an environment where maybe you have to put on a show or you know, be in any way disingenuous or fake to accomplish something that 
doesn't make sense, you know, like having more connections. I mean, all of that stuff seems like for someone who grew up in a very practical work environment uh, on a farm where everything on a farm makes sense. You don't do something just to look good. I mean, you clean the horse's hooves and you feed the hay, feed them hay and you change their water out and you, you know, tend to the pasture. Everything makes sense on a farm and it's not done for appearances, but Hollywood yeah. and, and school for that matter too. School is a lot of it doesn't make any sense. Like why? Okay. Why am I learning, <laughs> learning this algebraic yeah. equation that I'm never going to use again the rest of my life? Uh, that type yeah. Of I thing. never learned any of that. So don't worry. Right? Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The social structures in school and in Hollywood, is just something I never have gotten good at. And I, I've been thinking about it a lot lately, especially during this past year of not really seeing a lot of people. I wish I was better at it, but there's something about something magical that happens when you're on a set where everyone knows their job and everyone's good at it. And everyone is showing up confident. And even if you're not confident in that moment, like if I'm scared to do a scene or something, you look around, you're like, okay, we're all here for the same reason. We all want to do this. And there's something really encouraging and comfortable about that. Mm -hmm. And that's not how it is when you exist in the real world outside of a movie set. You know, I don't know, you know, you go to the grocery store, not everyone's there for the same reason. Everyone's going through different things and everyone, you never know who's going to talk to you. And those, those are the kind of situations that really freak me out. But when I'm on a movie set, I'm perfectly comfortable and happy. So mm -hmm. I wish I was better at the socializing thing in this town. <laughs> I don't yeah. talk about this much. But I wish, I wish I was better at it. I feel like it would have been. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're, I think you're doing pretty well, even with those, uh, okay. those deficits. Okay. Uh, press, press, doing press has, has been a, a challenge for me in my career, but it's actually probably giving me a lot of confidence too. Like doing, I did a lot of press for the magicians and comic cons and, and panels and all that kind of stuff over the years. And at first it was really, really difficult. And then I realized, oh, it's just a character. I just have to put on a character who knows how to talk this way or how to talk to strangers or, right. you know, knows what she's doing. And once I figured out who that character was, I just, played that character, you know, and eventually, I mean, it's, it's just me, but it, it was a good, it was a good coping mechanism in the beginning. Mm, that's interesting. So if you're giving advice to a 17 year old who wants to be an actor or wants to work in Hollywood, and given that we are in a different world now with devices that allow for content creation and different opportunities that you didn't have, what advice would you give to say a room full of 17, 18 year olds who want to do what you do? Oh man. You know, it used to be when I get asked that question, I would say, go make, go make your thing, go find friends and get together and write something and just make content, make it, make it, make it. And that has shifted so much in the last few years because every person is doing that. And the market is so saturated now, and it's really hard to find your own unique voice. So I think giving that advice doesn't really help anymore because everyone knows that that's like well known you just make mm -hmm. your own things now right i think what's important for kids to focus on is finding what their voice is and if they want to be an actor and you know pursue film and television i think they need to watch a ton of film and television and become a cinephile and know what's good and know what the good filmmakers are and and actors and and really focus on their craft and then take that into whatever content they're going to create and, and find their own voice. Um, mm. I'm completely mystified by this current generation's ability to market themselves on social media. It's something that's so not how I function in my head. As an actor, I grew up being like, no, you got to stay mysterious. You can't let people who know who you are so that you can, when you get a job, you transform and people don't know your personal life. And then it's the complete opposite now. And it's, I don't know. I feel like, sorry, I'm kind of going off on a tangent, but I think it's it's a difficult question to answer now. It's difficult advice to give because yeah. I don't know I don't know what the answer is anymore, other than know what your voice is because there's a lot of voices. And if you can know what your own voice is, what you're good at and what you like doing, just like keep pushing, 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 pushing. And yeah. I mean it, it the the reality of the business now is that's where people are going to find talent is on TikTok and and Twitter and Instagram. And that's where agents are finding people. And that's where you can really make a name for yourself, especially 
comedic actors. That's like, it's like such a good time for anyone you're trying to be a comedian right now, because you can just, you have a stage on your phone. And if you can just post every day, a funny video, you're, you'll make your way somehow. So I think it's just focusing on what your voice is. Huh. And what about being in LA and doing the hustle that you did? Is that still critical? I think so. Um, I think it's changed a little bit, especially now that most things are done online. Like, you know, specifically in our current environment, you know, you can submit, I haven't done an audition in person in two years. So everything is done online. So you don't necessarily have to move to LA to get an agent to audition, to be in this business. I mean, I think, you know, hopefully once the pandemic has gotten better, we will be doing more in-person stuff, but I don't know. I've been thinking about that a lot lately because I I'm currently living in Vancouver and I don't really need to go back to LA right now to be searching for, you know, my next job and all the meetings I'm doing, you can do it from anywhere, but there is something magical about being in LA and seeing people and meeting people that I don't think will ever go away. I just don't know if it's completely necessary anymore. Um, yeah, that makes if you're sense. trying to survive in LA, I don't know, man, it's hard. <laughs> get a good job <laughs> and try to be on set. I think that right. that is still true. I did, I think is still good advice. And, and, you know, I think everybody in this business should be a PA at, at one point, even if it's the d- director or lead actor, everyone needs to know every aspect of this business. I mean, I think that I've worked in the camera department. I've been in AC. I worked in the grip department. I, I did grip and electric for a film when I was younger. I've, I've done hair and makeup. Like I've worked in every department. And I think that that is such an important skill set to have is to know what everybody's doing on a set. And that's something that young kids right now who make content for themselves, that's not something they experience. They don't learn necessarily that how the whole business works from their living room. You have to actually go and experience it. You know, you have to immerse yourself in it. So I guess that's something that you can't get unless you're in LA and you're hustling, trying to find jobs on sets. I think that, that that's still very important. I hope yeah, this I isn't say, boring. No, I, <laughs> it's fascinating stuff. And that's why I asked you the question. It's, it's, uh, it's good stuff. And I, I was just interviewing and I, I just launched an episode of my interview with Jeffrey Paul King, who was. And Jeff's a friend of mine. Oh, really? I, he, yeah, Jeff, yeah, yeah. He's a good friend of mine. Well, you should check out my interview with, of Jeff I because um, we talk about this subject in, in a roundabout way where, you know, what advice do you have for, for younger folks and, He's, he told this funny story about working for a writer and a, a big time writer. I think she was a Grey's Anatomy showrunner, uh-huh. and he was he was an intern. And uh, he said, a lot of people these days are you know like, oh, you want me to make coffee? Well, that's not what I'm here to do. Or you know, you want me to get you a cup of tea? That's come on, I'm here to do something more substantive. But he decided, you know what, I'm going to make her. She asked me to make her a cup of tea. I said, I'm going to make her the best fucking cup of tea she has ever had in her life. <laughs> and so he did. Yeah. And and that's how he treated it. He said, like every, like there was never a time when the copy machine was out of paper. The tea was always found fantastic and delivered exactly how she wanted it. And eventually, eventually that resulted in opportunities for him to review a script and give notes. And I, you know, I, it, it's so important. I'm, I'm, I mean, there's so many stories about people who started as, you know, a PA and now they're show running like Jeff. And I think that that has been lost a little bit currently as people don't want to, to work as hard and to do the dirty work. I mean, I have been in the shit in this business and done horrible jobs to, to make money, to pay my rent. I, taking out the trash. I mean, like the things that I, that I've done as a PA or working as an assistant for people like is hard, hard, hard work, but I think it builds character and it builds respect and it's the only way you're going to learn. So yeah, I think it's important that people starting start from the bottom and work their way up. Yeah. And then understand every aspect of it. And, you know, tea in the writer's room is one part of the business. Yeah, it's not a very yeah. glamorous part of the business, but if you can show that respect, like you're saying, and just you know, kind of earn your earn your stripes in a way, uh, you're going to go far. It goes a long way. You're yeah. going to go far, and people remember that, and people have respect for that. And I, I mean, it's something I'm proud of in my career. So I feel like I've earned my way to where I am. And yeah, 
everyone needs to get tea for somebody in this business or <laughs> take out yeah. their cash. Or <laughs> right. Well, um, Olivia, you have a, an Instagram account um, that I will put in the show notes so people can find you on Instagram. Uh, any other places where folks can find you online and check out what you're up to? Uh, no, Instagram is probably the best place to find me. Um, I'm on Twitter, but I don't use it. <laughs> I know I noticed that. I looked I looked at yeah. your account <laughs> pretty old. No, I really mainly use it when I'm promoting a show or something like that. Uh, Twitter really triggers my social anxieties. I can't go on there. The idea of plastering a word that'll live forever, like a sentence, just really scares the shit out of me. Yeah. Um, but um, no, I tried TikTok, but that also is very intimidating. I got to get better at that. People love that TikTok, but no, I mean, uh, Instagram. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, Olivia, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Thank you so much. And tell Carson I said hi. I will do that. And Al, I'm talking to Al tomorrow too. So. Oh, awesome. You'll have fun. <laughs> hey, thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, I have a favor to ask. Can you go to wherever you listen to podcasts and leave me a review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. You can also check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook with the handle at DreamPathPod. And as always, go find your dream path. <laughs>